The earliest spiders didn't have spinnerets, those silk organs like you always see on spiders that produce spider silk. No, the earliest spiders, when spiders first evolved, had something called crebellum which were just little plates on the outsides of their exoskeletons, and it translates to little sieve. And it's little sieve because these plates had 40,000 holes in them. Some spiders, like this one here, still have crebellum. Now what these crebellum did, it didn't work like a spinneret which would draw silk out into a fine line, like you may expect. No, it extruded out kind of like those Play-Doh spaghetti toys that they used to have. And these very, very, very thin lines of silk would come out, and as they came out they would look kind of woolly. Almost like that uh, spider silk that you would buy maybe at a Halloween store around Rocktober. <laughs> but this kind of webbing, like you may have not seen before, is the original webbing that caught insects and other prey animals. And how it worked is really fascinating because this was before spiders evolved little goo, little goo and glue droplets on the silk to catch their prey. Instead, these lines, these little woolly little lines were made out of silk strands that were so thin, just tens of nanometers thin that they caught insects using van der Waals forces. And van der Waals forces are uh, taking advantage of the weak electrical, electromagnetic uh, attractions between atoms and molecules. Not explicitly positive and negative, but just the little partial charges that uh, atoms and molecules can have as electrons whiz about randomly. So these tiny, 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 tiny silk lines could instantly adhere themselves to the oils on the exoskeletons of the prey insects because they were so small. They could interact with their prey on an atomic level. It didn't, in, didn't include any adhesive at all, just fundamental forces of nature, which I think is amazing. So, not all web is as you expect, and spiders can use their web for many different applications, like a Spider-Man trying to save a Gwen Stacy. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Because Science Live, the live edition of this channel, where I take all your comments, questions, and corrections, and weird comments, additionally, live off the top of my head. And if I do not know something, I will admit it, but I will try my best as your conduit of nerdery to the rest of wherever I am. I have Nate here somewhere. Nate. Yeah, I'm here. Where, though? I'm just, you know. Around. Yeah, around. I get it. What do we have? From Matterbeam. Oh, hello, MB. My question to Kyle is, mm. in car crashes, people have survived dozens of Gs, both positive and negative, including whiplash from airbags. Sure. Could we assume a higher, a higher survivable limit for Gwen Stacy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I went through this just a little bit in the episode, um, but the, ex the survivable rate for deceleration and acceleration depends heavily on time. Uh, well, actually, no, I didn't mention this in the episode. I'm researching this for an upcoming episode. So uh, your su the survivability of a certain number of Gs depends heavily on the duration over which you are experiencing those Gs. So uh, as Matterbeam points out, if you are pulling you know, 6 to 10 to 12 to 15 or so Gs uh, during a car crash or whatever into an airbag, obviously that's survivable. But why? It's because the duration is very, very short. Humans can survive deceleration and accelerations, especially on their body parts, that are hundreds of Gs as long as the duration is very short. And it's more like a shock then than anything. Um, so high five the friend that you're sitting next to. It's okay. I know they're not there. <laughs> I can't high five anyone. I'm not trying to make fun of anybody. Anyway, just have someone high five you or high five yourself. Last time I said get a friend to do the reaction time test, a lot of you <laughs> were like, we don't have any. Anyway, uh, so uh, a high five can produce hundreds of Gs locally on the palm of your hand, but obviously your hand doesn't get obliterated by those G-forces. That's because the duration is so short. Now, if you extend that duration out, your G tolerance, your tolerance to G forces goes way down. So I think testing for NASA astronauts, say in a centrifuge, and they gave them tests to do as they were spinning around, I think they, you, can, uh, you can tolerate like two to three to five uh, Gs to 10 Gs for minutes and be 
okay. But if you uh, subject um, test subjects to like 20 Gs, um, 20 Gs of acceleration, I think the duration goes down uh, to like five seconds or so, less than five seconds. So uh, it, it gets very, very, very short. So duration is incredibly important. Now back to Gwen Stacy. Uh, I didn't say this in the episode because I thought it was just going a little bit overboard with all the math and I didn't want to uh, scare any of you. But uh, I checked for the duration of Gwen Stacy's uh, deceleration and she would only be experiencing uh, the six Gs of eyeballs up deceleration for under a second. And according to studies that I could find, that is still in the survivable range. If you extend that, if she was experiencing six Gs for 30 seconds, it might be a different story. But I think we're still good. So it's not just the G force that matters. It's also d the duration of that force that matters quite a bit. If you look at military studies of people doing uh, the rocket sled, for example, um, the rate of acceleration, the, no, the, the rate of g-forces over time is part of the graph always. Like, you, you could take 500 g's across this amount, this short amount of time in a tenth of a second, you can be fine, but you cannot take 500 g's for one second or two seconds or whatever. So it gets very specific, and uh, thanks for pointing that out, Matterbeam. What's next? From a MKD Gaming, do you Oh, yes, frequent commenter. Yeah. Hello. Do you have a degree, or are you just otherwise knowledgeable about uh, that kind of thing? Well, uh, it's twofold. So, uh, A, it should be said that I only seem to know a few things for these, for these live shows off the top of my head, like this kind of stuff, because I literally get paid to do it all day. This is my day job. I, uh, thanks to you and all the viewers, I get to come into whatever this place is, and all I do is research and write and do the scripts and perform the videos. And so I get to look up weird stuff and calculate weird stuff all day. So that helps a lot. But what helps probably more so is that um, I do have a degree. I have an uh, undergraduate degree in civil and environmental engineering. And engineering is great for this kind of thing because when you take engineering, you do a lot of different courses in science. So uh, I've taken, you know, calculus and biology and physics and statics and dynamics and thermodynamics and a, a lot of different courses across the sciences. Um, so it gives me, I'm not an expert in anything, but I know a little bit about a lot of fields of science and more importantly what uh, getting a good education does, thankfully I was very uh, lucky to get a good education. Um, what a good education can do is teach you how to think. So more importantly than what degree I have, I feel like for a lot of the questions we answer on this channel, I know how to go about answering those, making assumptions, looking for data, doing calculations. All, all of my episodes are usually just basic math. We almost never do calculus. So it is more about how to approach situations and critical thinking skills. Critical thinking is incredibly important, especially in this day and age, unfortunately. Um, so, oh, so uh, undergraduate in civil environmental engineering, and then I wanted to do more of this, science communication. I wanted to help fill the gap left by, oh, great segue. I, I wanted to help fill the gap uh, left by the people who inspired me to get into science, uh, like Carl Sagan, and it, it is his birthday today. Uh, so happy birthday, Carl. You are an incredible inspiration to so many people and myself. Um, amazing. But I wanted to help fill that void, um, the Mythbusters void, the Carl Sagan void, the Bill Nye the Science Guy void. So I went after my engineering into communication and I got a master's degree in uh, communication focusing on science communication for my thesis. Um, so I have two degrees, one advanced, one not, and uh, I feel like the rest of my learning is just my day job, which is very, I, I'm very fortunate to be able to do it. Um, and it feels like I'm doing something, which is good. Oh, you're going to make me cry. What's next? From Adrian C. Hmm. I'd like to know if there's a scientific way to find out how many 10-year-olds I can fight at once. <laughs> what? Why didn't you just pick an age that wouldn't be problematic? How, you want to know how many 10-year-olds you could fight? I don't know. Go down to a playground and get arrested? <laughs> Uh, 
I don't know. How many ten year olds can you fight? Uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't know how to answer this question. I mean, I mean, if you want, this is this is this is something that would have to be empirically based. That is, you'd have to go out and do the experiment yourself. Like, okay, I'll fight one ten-year-old and see how I feel after that. Uh, a lot of things in science, uh, a lot of laws, not laws, sorry, a lot of, a lot of data points, a lot of um, equations that you can find in studies. Like, oh, this is how rough sand is, is based on empirical data. So we go out and we look and then we use equations and try to fit that, that fit the data and try to come up with general rules and estimations and things like that. It's hard to establish a law <laughs> of how many children you can fight. <laughs> uh, uh, five. You can fight five ten-year-olds. One would get you. <laughs> Don't get arrested. What's next? <laughs> Why? Why? Why do you want to know how many ten? Why couldn't you just say like ducks or something? I don't know. Bunch of weirdos in here. Wherever you are. Sorry, what's next? From uh, Falcon Lance. Ooh, that's not your real name, is it? Because that's pretty close to the coolest name I've ever heard. <laughs> Who are you? Falcon Lance. Anyway. Can you explain how we landed a probe on a, on a comet? Oh, well, I, I believe you're talking about the Rosetta probe that landed on oh, the comet with the... Russian name that I cannot pronounce. It has a designation that I also cannot remember. But Rosetta, the Rosetta mission, and I don't know much about it. I, I'm not, well, I mean, I followed it like we all probably did. And I'm not an expert, but what, what I will say is the important part, I think, and, and uh, I apologize if I'm seeming like I, I'm answering something that you definitely already know, but in case some of you don't know, uh, you're not just picking something and then uh, landing on it uh, from nowhere, by which uh, I mean uh, you're <laughs> a comet has a lot of velocity. It's going very, very quickly. And so you cannot just approach it from nowhere and then just expect to land on it because you're going to miss it. So a big... Uh, and an important part of planning a mission like this is that you have to know the trajectory and the motion of a comet or another body that you want to land on very, very, very well because you have to plan a path that will meet up with the comet at a certain, uh, at a certain time. And remember, we're launching these probes and shuttles and everything from very, very far away. So you have to be very sure on the math. You have to plan out a perfect path that by the time you get to wherever you want to go, you are going, relatively speaking, the same velocity. So you can land easily, like you are just dropping onto something. If you had to go out to a comet, say if you went out to a comet and then jumped on it, you'd be suddenly going you know, hundreds of meters per second, or, or many kilometers per second, rather, and that would be really dangerous. So. Um, uh, again, I apologize if this is basic understanding, uh, basic knowledge to you, but you have to uh, expertly, using math and uh, astronomical uh, calculations, you have to expertly match the paths of these uh, heavenly bodies or else you're going to miss them. And, and that's where all the planning and all the mathematics and all the calculations go into, and it's very, very important. And uh, that's all I, I have any, uh, <laughs> any grounding to say about that. But it was very cool. Did you see the GIF that someone made? Um, hard G, by the way. Did you see the GIF that someone made of the images taken from the surface of the comet? It looked like uh, you know astronomical snow was falling on it. It wasn't, but it, it looked like this weird wonderland and it was so alien. It was, it was so so cool. If you haven't seen that, you should look up. Uh, what's next? From DJ Crumrine, okay. what's your favorite marker color? <laughs> not not the. Uh, not the catchiest DJ name, if you if you had to ask me. Oh, uh, what well, my favorite marker color? It's not blue, that's for sure. Uh, I like the red. The red pops, man. I like the red. Uh, I wish I wish wherever I got my markers from had more colors. I would love to do that for you, but I'm going with a uh, tried and true five colors. It helps. What's next? From Chaos Dijini, as a science communicator. Have you discussed or debated with someone who has who was anti-intellectual or denied common scientific theories? 
How did you handle this situation? Hmm. Okay, well, this is interesting because uh, uh, when I started my career, if you want to call it that, I started as a science writer, and, and what I focused on a lot was pseudoscience and myths and legends, and uh, I was more debunking and uh, you know spirits and ghosts and all that and all that kind of stuff, and Bigfoot. And so I spent a lot of time arguing with people about those those beliefs. And no matter what you want to say about those people or what is true and what is not as true, um, what I've found now is that I, I've kind of moved away from trying to be overly debunky, as some scientists might be on Twitter that you follow. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. But so, some scientists to me and communicators to me can be overly debunky. And how I understand it, how I've, um, how I've seen debunking work with people who don't already agree with you, and psychological studies back this up, is that if someone doesn't, doesn't see your point of view and you start debunking someone, something or someone, they attribute the negative feeling that that makes to you as a person so that you are a negative person. Now what you're saying, not just what you're saying is negative, but you are negative or mean or bad. And so I wanted to get away from de outwardly debunking anything, saying something is dumb or it's definitely not possible and you're stupid. I, I did not want, I, I wanted to distance myself from that because it can make you seem like you are mean and you are in, and, and you're not helping. And what I wanted to do and what I want to do is help. I want to help people learn if possible, if I can. Um, so now I, I don't really um, spend any time arguing with people about conspiracy theories or uh, Bigfoot or Loch Ness Monster and ghosts and spirits like I used to do because I feel like a lot of the time they're not, he they're not there to listen to me. They just want to argue. Now, another part of your question, I think, is that if you had to argue with someone about something like that, how would you go about it? And the, the way, if, if you had to, is definitely not be overtly negative about it. Like, how, how could you believe that? That's so silly. Or, or that's so dumb for you to think that. It's like, no, it's not their fault. You know, maybe someone can believe something for uh, what you consider the wrong reasons, but that doesn't make them a bad person. So you want to approach topics like that um, from, from base level. You know, why do you think that? What evidence do you see that points you towards that conclusion? What have you heard? What have you seen? What, what, do, what do you think about X, Y, Z that leads you to that conclusion? And I think when you start there, um, you can come to a point where you know someone might say, "Well, I mean, okay, look, you're right. I mean, maybe that's not the you know maybe a blurry photograph isn't perfect evidence." And it's like, well, how does that change your belief or not? You know, so you can start kind of a Bayesian reasoning for that based on what you see. How would you change your belief? Um, and if you and sometimes that works, it's worked for me. And sometimes you get to a point where um, you are just not speaking the same language. You're like, no, uh, uh, you know, uh, data doesn't matter to me. All right, well, I guess we're done talking. So uh, have a great rest of your day. I mean, that's a lot of a lot of conversations can end that way. So um, I spent a lot of time doing that, but now I, I try to be more uh, more positive um, and more. Uh, approachable because I, I feel like when you're uh, when you're too debunky I don't know if you're being a net positive it can feel good arguing with someone and feeling like you're right but are you really making an impact I'm not so sure so I, I steer cl clear of that a little bit what's next from Izzy Garcia hello could we create a star from raw materials oh what uh hmm hmm um so, that's kind of, hmm, okay. So, um, how would you create a star from raw materials? Well, the raw materials of a star are the most abundant uh, elements in the universe. Our sun is hydrogen and helium, for the most part, um, and we have that, so why can't we make a star on Earth? Well, it's, about, it's a mass problem, right? So, um, a sun, the sun is enormous. A million Earths could fit inside of it, I think. <laughs> so it's enormous. There's a lot of mass there. And when you have a lot of mass, it compresses itself very hard together. The uh, closer you get to the center, there's more pressure, more heat, more everything. And all of that uh, encourages nuclear fusion to happen. 
as well as quantum tunneling, without which the sun would not emit the energy it does. But that's for another time. So you need a lot of mass and a lot of energy, a lot of heat, a lot of pressure. That's how you create a star in the wild. How would you do it on Earth? You would need to replicate the conditions. You would need to create the same kind of immense, immense heat and pressure um, to get things to fuse. And uh, scientists are trying to do something like this by creating those same forces on the same materials, aspects of uh, isotopes of hydrogen, and trying to replicate the process that powers the sun in the lab. But for more on that and how scientists are doing that right now, you'll have to stay tuned for a very special something coming to you next week on this channel. Serendipitous that you asked that because it's going to be cool. It's very cool. Next week. Stay tuned. Early next week. Not at the normal time. It's going to surprise you. What's next? From Sean Peary. Mm. Oh, yes. Super nerd. Sean. Hello. Yeah, I keep a list. I remember. How much force would it take to rip someone's limb from their body? What are you doing out there? You're fighting 10-year-olds. You're ripping people's arms off. What's going on? I know it's 2018. Yeah, it's rough out there. California's on fire. What are you doing? I don't know. I, 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 had a, I had a value in my head for a long time about how much force it would take to rip off a limb. And it was around, for whatever reason, it was around 10,000 newtons, um, thousands of pounds of force uh, to rip a limb off. But then I went back and I tried to, I was trying to source that value, and I could not. I have no idea where I got that value now. So um, ripping a limb off is a complicated thing. And like I was saying before about empirical data, this is something that it would be hard to armchair physics, by which I mean just assume a couple of things like we do a lot on this show. Just assume a couple of things and calculate and say, well, it's probably, you know, 50. No. Ripping a limb off is a complicated affair, which involves a lot of different materials, uh, skin, bone, tendons, muscle, all with their own different properties, all with their own tensile strengths, all with their, uh, all this different stuff. It depends on the orientation of their limb, how the joints are uh, situated when you're doing it, um, what's the age of the person, what's the fitness level of the person. I mean, all of these factors would come into play. And so it would, there's probably a huge range over which a limb could come off. Um, and so because you can't do these kinds of studies on people, um, you can do something like that on a cadaver, I suppose, but I don't know of any studies that have done that. Um, excuse me. Uh, so uh, you need experimental data for that kind of thing, and I do not think that we have that. You could probably put an upper limit, uh, not an upper limit, you could probably put a lower bound on it that some amount of forces where you get, start getting into limb ripping, um, but I don't know what that is. Uh, the closest thing I can think of is that um, there have been a couple of tug of war accidents with a lot of people, and they have their arms ripped off. But that's more of the <laughs> look what you've done to me. But that's more of the rope snapping and then kind of like shearing their arms off, like, like a like one of those, <laughs> like a cheese knife going through, like with the wires. Anyway, oh man. What have you done to me? I don't know how much force it would take to rip off a limb. You'd have to make a lot of very good assumptions and base it on some data, which I do not have. But I probably will look into it again sometime. What's next? From the Reaper, does the Death? What? what? What is happening today? Sorry, it's TH3 Reaper. <laughs> the Reaper himself. <laughs> sure, what do you got? Death hit me. Not. Physically, because I'll die. Does quantum theory only apply to mechanics, or can it apply to other areas of science? Oh, no. Do I look like a quantum physicist to you? <laughs> they can, scientists can look like anyone. I misspoke. Uh, does quantum mechanics speak to anything besides mechanics? Is that what they say? Other areas of science. Other areas of science. Well, um, hmm. Maybe I'm interpreting your question the wrong way, but quantum mechanics um, 
even though it seems weird, and when most, it is weird, but when most people like me will talk about it, they'll make it seem like absolutely mysterious and incomprehensible. But that's not exactly true. Quantum physics, well, it's not true. Quantum physics uh, makes some of the most precise uh, cal uh, make, make some of the most precise estimations we've ever had in science at all, like provable things, where it's like, oh, if this quantum theory is true, then this would be 0 0.00000009. And it turns out to be exactly true. It makes incredibly precise measurements to, uh, you know, to significant figures that you can't really find anywhere else in science. So uh, quantum physics, we know it extremely well to the point where that's how you're watching this video with all, all the electronics going on, uh, um, uh, the microchips and, and, and processors and, stu and, and uh, equipment in your phone. All of this stuff is enabled by an intricate understanding of quantum mechanics and how the electrons are moving around inside of uh, your phone or your tablet or your device or, or what have you. Um, so even though quantum mechanics is always heralded as the most confusing thing. And you know people like Richard Feynman say, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't. And it's true. But we still have a very firm grasp on it. And uh, it applies to everything because it's the, f it's the underpinning, as far as we know it, of the physical universe. At the bottom, there's a fabric of quantumness. Um, and so, uh, you know, it used to be the realm of just physics, but now, you know, you, you can see studies of, okay, how are birds, how, how are birds um, locating the places where they originally hatched if they're thousands and thousands of miles away? And we, we start linking this to like a magneto sense that depends on quantum mechanical interactions happening in their body, which is amazing. So, uh, Quantum mechanics applies to everything. It is not just abstract physics stuff because it's the underpinning of the universe. Is, did I do good? You, you did good. Am I done? <laughs> one more question. Oh, no. OK. It's an easy one. OK. From UKN Venom, Ooh. what hair products do you use? Look, OK, said this many times, trying to get a sponsorship. Look, dudes, you got to shower more often. You got to shampoo that hair. You got to use conditioner. Beyond that, blow dry. Blow drying, wow, it turns out that 50% of the population was right that blow drying was good uh, forever, which I just learned. Second thing, number two, dudes, put some oil in your hair. Reduces, reduces frizz. Adds sheen. Keeps it healthy. I use argan oil. Swear by argan oil. I mean, come on. Come on. How wrong could I be about that? That's what I use. Sponsor me, Majestic Oil. And that's all the time we have for this episode. Shameless. For this episode of Because Science Live, thank you so much for watching uh, and for all of your questions and for bearing with me with all of my spider facts. Uh, I hope you had uh, a wonderful week so far. Um, thanks for watching uh, the latest episode about Gwen Stacy and how she might be able to survive her fall. Next week, we have something special coming for you. And then we also have a new vlog, which has something special as well in it. It's going to be very cool. Uh, and then a new episode, which is pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's a pretty good new one. And uh, another live stream. Until then, have a wonderful weekend. If you are in California, please stay safe. Happy birthday to Carl Sagan, the patron saint of this kind of thing. And be nice to each other. Even though this is digital, we are all still real people on the other end of these things. Uh, and this is all we got.